to really uh, guide the nation of Israel and to govern them as God's chosen people. Well, in the weeks that followed that, we have been methodically working our way through each of the individual commandments. So on the, on the first week, when we worked through the first commandment, we discovered that it was a command to really worship the one and only true God. The second commandment was a command to worship God in the right way and not to confine him or define him in an object or in an idol. The third commandment, and uh, Michael talked about this last week, it was a commandment that was really all about worshiping God sincerely and not minimizing him by misusing his name. Well, the fourth commandment that we're going to be looking at today really is a command to set aside time to worship him on a regular basis. You know, when you look closely at all of the Ten Commandments, it's, it's really easy to divide them into two separate and different parts. You know, the first four commandments really speak to our relationship with God, where the next six relate to how we interact with one another. So today, we are wrapping up these first four commandments that really were intended to act as the basis for how the nation of Israel was to interact with God. Or, put another way, they were intended to act as a basis for how these spiritual infants back then were to enter into a relationship with this God that they really didn't know. The fourth commandment starts off this way, and we're going to work our way through it. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So just to pause for a minute here, the Hebrew word for remember here means a lot more than what we would think, because when we think about what remember means, we think it means don't forget, right? But this word in Hebrew actually means commemorate. So much like we would remember our wedding anniversary by buying a gift, right men? We're all faithful at that. Or we remember a birthday by throwing a party. God is telling the nation of Israel here that they need to hold this day as being different than all the other days of the week. It continues, verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male nor your female servant, nor your animals nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So what we want to do this morning is to work through the biblical teachings on the Sabbath. Now, obviously, if we are here this morning worshiping on Sunday, which is the first day of the week, and to my knowledge, nobody showed up yesterday, which was Saturday, which is in fact the Old Testament Sabbath, something has changed, hasn't it? Well, what I want us to do this morning is look a little bit at why it's changed. And what we want to do is actually look at the teachings through the Old Testament about the Sabbath. We want to look at the teachings in the Gospels about the Sabbath. And then when we, we look at the early church, we're going to see that something has shifted there, and we're going to talk about why that shifted and why it is that we're now meeting on Sundays. But just before we get into that deeper, I want to ask you to keep a few things in mind as we go through a number of passages of Scripture this morning. Firstly, Israel, in this passage that we've just looked at, is really being told to remember a day of rest. In fact, the word Sabbath means just that. It means rest. So when God's verbally communicating this commandment to the Israelites, he's not just saying, remember the Sabbath day, but he's also commanding them to take a day off. And as an important part of the relationship that he wants to have with them, he's asking them to set this day aside. Secondly, Yahweh's not just telling them to take a day off, but he's telling them to take a day off and keep it holy. This word literally means to set aside or to make it different from all the others in the week. So the Israelites were being told to set this day aside as being special and unique from all the other days. Specifically in verse 10, it says, keep it to the Lord, or as some translations put it, keep it for the Lord. 
In other words, this rest is not to be random and purposeless. It's to be a God-centered rest and attentions to be directed to God in a way that's more, more concentrated and steady than in the other six days of the week. They're being told to keep the day holy by keeping the focus on the holy God. Thirdly, they're being told that this holy day of rest should be done once out of every seven days. Verse 6, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. So he's telling them work six and then rest one. Work six and then rest one. Work six and rest one. And that's the pattern that's prescribed in the Ten Commandments for the nation of Israel. The fourth thing, and this might be a tough one for some of you, but he says no fudging on this commandment by saying, well, I'll keep the Sabbath day for myself, but, you know, you can't expect me to give my maid a day off. Or I'll keep my ox working by dangling a carrot out in front of its nose so it keeps moving forward. God says, no, that's not what I'm asking you to do. He's saying that if you try and keep the business running by using servants, employees, animals, and even relatives, then you're actually missing the point of what the Sabbath is. Fifth thing I want you to keep in mind, and maybe this is most important for our discussion this morning. Verse 11 leads us to the basic point of the commandment, and it says, simply put, the rationale for this commandment is based on God the Father's example. It's based on God's rest after creation. So God's telling the nation of Israel here to make the last day of the week, which is Saturday, into this holy day of rest. So the root rationale for this then is based on Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, where we're told by by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work he had been creating that he had done. It's interesting to point out that in both this Genesis passage, as well as in Exodus 20, God uses those two words, blessed and holy, when it talks about this day. So what God is really saying here to the nation of Israel, to his chosen people, is this. He's saying, let you, my favorite creation, the one that I made in my own image, stop once every seven days, and focus on a relationship with me. Let him stop working and focus on the fact that I am the source, the true source of all he really needs. Let him separate that one day out of seven, and let's make that a day where we can connect with one another in a meaningful way. Let him come to me on that day and find rest one day out of seven, and on that day he will receive a special blessing that he will not find during the other six days of the year. You know, it's it's also interesting to note that we have been talking about the Ten Commandments from Exodus, and if you remember when they received that, they were just two months out of slavery, two months from their departure from Egypt at a moment when they were feeling displaced. They were fearful of the future, and God came to them at that particular moment as they stood at the foot of Sinai and audibly gave them these words. But you know, as we've been looking the last many weeks at the Exodus passage, Exodus 20 passage, where God first gives them the Ten Commandments, did you know that God also gave them the Ten Commandments 40 years later? After their wanderings in the desert and just before they were about to enter the Promised Land, God again gives them the Ten Commandments. This time, a whole new generation he gives them to. You know, one of the things that's so interesting about this second Ten Commandments is that they're virtually identical except for this fourth commandment, where there are two slight additions. God's not changing the commandment, but he's actually adding a couple of things to it. We find that second Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and the the differences are this. The first difference we see right at the very beginning of each passage, because in Exodus 20, the passage we read this, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. In the Deuteronomy chapter 5 passage, we find that it says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
So where Exodus uses the word remember, Deuteronomy uses the word observe. Where Exodus uses the phrase remember the Sabbath, Deuteronomy uses the phrase observe the Sabbath. And it seems that there's now something more active about how God wants the Israelites to keep this special day of rest versus just remembering and imitating God's rest after creation. He's now telling them, don't just remember it, but it's almost as if he's telling them to live this as part of your regular lifestyle. He's saying, embrace this. The second difference that's found in these passages really happened at the end of the commandment, and it relates to the reason for observing the Sabbath. So in Exodus, as we've just said, the reason we're told to remember the Sabbath has everything to do with following the example that God gave us. He worked for six days, and then he took one off. He expressed his creativity in six days, and then he took a day of rest. And Exodus tells the listeners to imitate God's example. In Deuteronomy, though, we find God telling them that they're to observe the Sabbath not just for themselves, but it emphasizes that they need to honor the Sabbath by giving rest to those they have influence over as well. It's a reminder that they were once slaves themselves, and God had freed them, and God had showed them mercy and compassion, and God gave them rest. So the Israelites are now being told to imitate God's mercy and give those that they oversee an opportunity to experience this special day of worship and rest as well. My whole point in bringing up these two passages is simply this, that God established this day for the nation of Israel with the intent that it would be purposeful, that it would be meaningful, that it would be profound, and it would be a blessing to everyone who did it. He established this day with the nation of Israel as an important part of his covenant with them, and they were to honor this special day by resting and by gathering together to worship. But they were also told to keep it holy by showing mercy and compassion to those they were in a position to show that to. So while we're camped out in the Old Testament here, let me give you another verse that helps to clarify how God felt about this day. And this happens later on in Exodus, in Exodus 31. And starting at verse 12, it reads, Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come. So you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. In fact, he's saying not out of some religious exercise, not because somebody is mandating you do this, to do this, but do it because it is holy to you personally. Verse 16, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So in this passage, the nation of Israel is being told that the Sabbath is also to be a sign to them, and it points to the truth that they were continually being told that they should never, ever, ever forget. And the truth is this, that God had chosen them, that God had set them apart, and that this was to be a reminder that he was at work in them to make them distinct amongst the other people of the earth. So in summary, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and Exodus 31 all teach that the Sabbath is a way of remembering and expressing this truth that God established this day with the intent that it would be purposeful, meaningful, profound, and a blessing to those people who were part of the nation of Israel. But you know, as we've seen so many times already, it's kind of ironic that that passage in Exodus 20 starts with the word remember, because as the Israelites would prove once again, they had short memories. We see something kind of shift later in the Old Testament, and there's a passage in Isaiah that was written to clarify something that was quickly becoming this, this common misunderstanding about the Sabbath. You see, over time, the nation of Israel, this fourth commandment that was intended to be a gift, that was intended to be a blessing to them, had actually become a curse. Because people were only thinking in terms of what they were now not allowed to do on that day. 
So Isaiah has to remind the Israelites in Isaiah 58, and this is what he says in, in, starting in verse 13. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words. In other words, he says, if you can remember that this is why the Sabbath was created, And then in verse 14, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob. The point that's being made here is simply this. In the Old Testament, God's original purpose for the nation of Israel was that this Sabbath would be a day where they would experience the highest and most intense joy that they could experience. God's original purpose for the nation of Israel was that the Sabbath would be a day where they take delight in the Lord, as the passage says. It's interesting to think about the passage in Exodus when they first received the Ten Commandments. We talked about this earlier, just six weeks to eight weeks out of slavery. And when they were in Egypt, they had no day off, they had no break, No mental health days, no mandatory holidays, no union to negotiate on their behalf. They were slaves. They worked when they were told. They ate when they were told. They slept when they were told. They had no day of rest. They had no opportunity to stop and find relationship with their creator. Out of 365 days of the year, they worked 365 days. 52 weeks of the year, seven days a week. And you contrast that to what God is now offering them. I mean, I I don't know if we can even imagine that. To have God, for them to be just weeks out of slavery, telling you that you would now have one in every seven days off, that you would now have a regular day of rest and a regular day of worship. Shifting from working seven days a week in the hot sun just to keep you and your family alive. And if you weren't strong enough or if you weren't pulling your own weight, you would either be punished or you'd be killed. Leisure time back then wasn't even something that the Israelites could dream about. It wasn't an option for them to go camping on the weekend or a weekend at the cottage. No mandatory three weeks vacation, no stat days, no spring break, no Christmas break. So if that were you, would you actually consider the Sabbath to be a burden? If your God came to you with omnipotent authority and said, I don't want you to have to work so much. I want you to have a day every week to rest and enjoy what's really important in life. And I promise This is the other interesting thing. It was a promise that I am going to meet your needs during the first six days of the week. That's not a cruel command, my friend. It is a gracious gift that was being offered to the nation of Israel. But this gift to the nation was quickly becoming anything but a gift. You know, when we come over to the New Testament, we find that centuries have passed and the rabbis have added details and details and details to this commandment. In fact, they have filled in the blanks for the people. They have clarified what God supposedly meant when he said that. They had written a kind of Sabbath for dummies book and believe me, it was thick. And in doing that, what they had done to the Sabbath for the people was that they had really killed it in the minds of the nation of Israel. They had completely missed the point of what this wonderful gift was supposed to mean. The rabbis had gotten so specific with the nation of Israel, in fact, that they had actually come up with a list of 39 things that the people were prohibited to do on the Sabbath day. They had reduced this day of blessing into an ugly list of do's and don'ts. That list happened to include this They couldn't sow, they couldn't plow, they couldn't clean, they couldn't sift, they couldn't knead bread, 
They couldn't bake. They couldn't shear wool, wash it, beat it, dye it, spin it. You couldn't weave two threads. You couldn't separate two threads. You couldn't make a knot. You couldn't untie a knot. You couldn't sew two stitches. You couldn't write two letters. You couldn't build. You couldn't pull down. You couldn't extinguish a fire. You couldn't light a fire. You couldn't beat anything with a hammer. You couldn't carry property from one place to another. And that's the start of it, because they took each of those categories and literally came up with hundreds and hundreds of things that people were forbidden to do on the Sabbath. The Sabbath, this gift from God, this blessing, had been reduced to something that the people actually dreaded. It became a religious obligation, and it became this meaningless religious exercise that repeated itself week after week after week. And the people were told by their religious system, if you really want to please God, well, then don't even think about doing anything on this list. There was one particular law that told people that tying a knot was not permitted because it actually took two hands. And the rabbis thought that that was way too general, so they found it necessary to define which knots were permitted and which were not. The law eventually changed so that the people were told, those knots that can be untied with one hand, well, that's okay to do. But if you need two hands to tie it, then don't even think about it, because that's work, and God forbids that. Understanding all of this, what I've just said about the Sabbath, are we really surprised that the major conflict that the religious community had with Jesus was what? It was what he chose to do on the Sabbath. They were often attacking Jesus for what he was doing on the Sabbath. In fact, it's quite possibly their greatest criticism of him. They hated him for it. They were furious that he refused to openly follow their man-made rules about the Sabbath. I want to look very quickly at two stories that illustrate that, both from Matthew chapter 12. Both illustrations of this. The first story, starting in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, began to pick some heads of the grain and eat them, which was not permitted by the Sabbath. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful for the Sabbath. Actually, the fourth commandment didn't say that. But the man-made rules that had been built around that did. Verse 3, he answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was unlawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read the law? The priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words meant, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So let's notice a couple things about that first story. Because first notice that Jesus doesn't dispute the charge against the disciples, because technically they were breaking the rabbi's law. But he does call his disciples innocent, just like David and the priests in the examples he brings up. He says David technically broke the law by by eating what was only lawful for the priests. He says the priests in the temple work on the Sabbath and technically break the letter of the law as well. So Jesus tells them that even though the letter of the law might have been broken technically, that these men are innocent. And he has given us commands to be helpful, not to be a burden. So in essence, what Jesus is saying, he's telling the Pharisees that they had taken the Sabbath, which was supposed to be this blessing, which was intended to be a benefit to man. And they were the ones that had turned it into a burden. But the passage goes on in Matthew. And if uh, you thought that response to the Pharisees was off, then you're going to think that you've entered the twilight zone for what happens next. Because it goes on in verse 9 and says this. Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, 
is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Their answer would have been no. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill him. So how mad were they at him for doing this? They were so mad at him for healing on the Sabbath that they wanted his head. And according to Jesus, the Pharisees could only condemn the innocent because they had never understood what Hosea 6.6 6 meant, which is the verse that he quotes in verse 7. And the verse is, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In other words, he says the whole law exists for the sake of mercy. And the Pharisees just couldn't see it, the true meaning of the Sabbath, because their hearts were just simply in the wrong place. This day that was given as a blessing, not a curse. The Sabbath was given as a gift of love to meet the need of the people, not as this oppressive burden to make them miserable. Sabbath was never intended to be this endless list of meaningful restrictions. It was given as an expression of love to people who had spent centuries and centuries in slavery. In these stories and in many others throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus in many ways, he embodied the Sabbath by healing and forgiving sins and by bringing people into relationship. The kind of relationship that the original Sabbath laws were intended to develop. I love how John Piper talks about this whole issue. He says, Jesus didn't come to abolish the Sabbath, but he came to dig it out from under the mountain of legalistic sediment and give it to us again as a blessing rather than as a burden. It's a day for showing mercy. It's a day for doing good. It's a day of relationship with the Creator. And it's a day of blessing. It's a day unlike any other day of the week for us to focus on the Lord. Well, as we move into the early church, almost immediately we see that something has shifted. And truthfully, we're really not sure when or what or even why it has happened. But it's clear that for the followers of Jesus, those people who are part of this new covenant, that the weekly day of rest and worship and blessing has changed from Saturday to Sunday. And there are a number of verses that really talk about this in the New Testament. In particular, we're going to look at two. And it suggests that it happened during the time of the apostles. The first verse is in Acts 20, verse 7. And it says, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people. And because he intended to leave the next day, kept talking until midnight. So this seems to be suggesting that there's this formal gathering that happened for the sake of the Lord's Supper on Sunday evening, the first day of the week. So it looks as though the switch to Sunday has already taken place for their worship. The second verse I want to look at is 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, and it's where Paul is trying to prepare the Corinthians for a collection that he's taking up for the churches in Jerusalem. And the verse reads this way. It says, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income saving it up so that when I come, collections will, not have, will have to be made. So it seems that in, on the first day of the week, that this is now the day when Christians are performing these special types of religious exercises. Well, these are only two of the references in the New Testament that seem to be suggesting that Christians now celebrate their day on Sunday, and the nation of Israel is still celebrating on the Saturday. You know, there's a couple of explanations as to why this might have happened. And one in particular really resonates with me. You know, if you've read through the epistles, then you know that there was an awful lot of confusion with the Jewish converts to Christianity. Early on, Christianity was seen as just another sect of Judaism, just another branch of it. But as it began to grow, people soon realized that Jesus came to create something new. 
He came to bring this new covenant to us. And, but the Jewish converts were struggling. Do we still have to be circumcised? Do we still have to sacrifice animals? Do we still have to obey all the customs of the Jewish faith? Well, the answer to that is no, and Jesus makes that very clear because Jesus came to bring that new covenant. We're told, in fact, that he came to fulfill the law. And where the old law pointed to the direction of what God wanted to do in the future, that old law, Jesus, is what that law was pointing to. I mean, there are those who believe, and I tend to be one of them, that the day of the week was changed because the Saturday Sabbath was part of the old law, and Jesus, part of this new covenant that he came to establish with people. This means that we can worship him and have our own Sabbath any time. The early church likely shifted the day from the last day of the week to the first day of the week. Because Jesus, the one who would be called the Lord of the Sabbath in John 20, he rose from the dead on the first day of the week. So just like God the Father's work in the first creation was finished on the seventh day of the week, Jesus' work on us, his new creation, was finished when he rose from the dead on the first day of the week. What's also very interesting to note is that Jesus met with his disciples five times after his resurrection, and those encounters always happened on a Sunday. When Jesus' followers received the Holy Spirit for the first time, it was on a Sunday. When the Great Commission was given to the church, it was on a Sunday. And Jesus ascended back to his Father on a Sunday. What we know for certain from the very earliest days of the Christian faith is that people of the way, the people of the book, have set aside the first day of the week as their usual day of worship. So really, and I hate to break this to you, but none of us legalistically celebrate the fourth commandment. But that doesn't mean that we don't celebrate what the New Testament calls the day of the Lord. And as it says in Colossians 2, starting at verse 16, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is what? It says the reality is found in Christ. Mark 2, verses 27 and 28 says, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord of even the Sabbath. So just like the second commandment tells us not to confine or define God and who he is in an idol or in an object, the fourth commandment is telling us we cannot define or confine our relationship with God to a day of the week anymore. But we can have that relationship with him any day. Jesus brought back the original purpose of the Sabbath. He says it was made for man. Why? Because we all live in a fallen world and we need rest. We live in a fallen world and we need a day, a special day of his blessing. We live in a fallen world and we need a day of connecting and reconnecting with our Lord. If you think about it, how crazy is it that the God who shook the ground in front of Mount Sinai and talked to the nation of Israel, he is saying to you and I this morning, that I want to have a day where we can spend in communion with one another. I want to connect with you. I want to have relationship with you. And it's my prayer that our celebration of the day of the Lord, as the New Testament calls it, that it could become all about that relationship with the living God through his Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray.